Hello and welcome back to Cheetah TV on this December the 4th, which is International Cheetah Day. So a very happy International Cheetah Day to you all. Now we're looking at conservation collaborations. Now many zoos around the world support conservation, um, both in situ and ex situ. So let's go over to the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium and speak to Susie Rapp who is not only Vice President of Animal Programs, but also a CCF trustee. So hi Susie, and thanks ever so much for joining us today. Why don't you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Thanks, Brian. I am Susie Rapp, and I'm Vice President of Animal Programs at Columbus Zoo. Um, I am also a, a trustee for the Cheetah Conservation Fund, very active in the Cheetah SSP. So cheetahs happen to be my passion, so I'm excited to be here today. I know the, uh, the Columbus Zoo very well, and I know that the cheetahs are, are one of your flagship species. So. Um, it's very fitting that we, we're, we're talking about cheetah conservation and the Columbus Zoo today. So how long has, has Columbus been involved with um, cheetahs and cheetah conservation? Well, I can tell you, Brian, when I started at the Columbus Zoo 40 years ago, we had one of the largest cheetah collections um, of any zoo. Um, when I started, we had 23 cheetahs. So we were really known for breeding and um, and I think the, the Columbus Zoo was doing some conservation work, but that was right around the time that Jack Hanna came on board as well. So the Columbus Zoo wasn't really the zoo that people know today. It was a much smaller zoo back then, uh, but cheetahs happened to be something uh, the zoo was very successful with. And then in time, they kind of fizzled out of the cheetah program. And then it was probably about uh, 18 years ago that um, I was able to finally get two cheetahs and um, really, really start with the ambassador program and uh, cheetah conservation. That's great. So it's, it's quite a while, all, all in all. It's, uh, it's, it's a long time to be involved. Now, a lot of people, when they look at zoos, they, they'll see zoos as, as you know, um, everybody's got their own opinion, obviously, but, um, you know, they'll see zoos as just a, a, a business, um, but what a lot of people don't realize is the involvement that, that, that zoos have got, not just with cheetah conservation, but cheetah conservation or, or conservation, should I say, right across the board. So I know that um, Columbus have, have got you know, a complete section or department dedicated to, to conservation. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the projects that um, the, the Columbus Zoo are directly involved with in the field? Well, um, Brian, you're correct. I mean, a lot of people don't realize. I think a lot of conservation organizations in the field wouldn't exist if it wasn't for these zoos. We give hundreds of millions of dollars to conservation every year to zoos across the country. And um, so uh, the conservationists know how important these zoos are because not only is it the dollar that we're raising for these conservation organizations, it's the messaging. Because when you have a project like in Namibia, like the Cheetah Conservation Fund, you can get some messaging out, but you can't get the messaging out that maybe we can get here at the Columbus Zoo. So that, you know, the Cheetah Conservation Fund is obviously uh, one of the conservation organizations that's very near and dear to my heart. But we are very involved with multiple uh, conservation organizations. We also fund some other Cheetah Conservation Organizations. We're also uh, very involved with elephant conservation, rhino conservation, polar bear conservation, red panda conservation, many reptile conservation projects. Um, I mean, I could go on and on and on. So uh, multiple, multiple conservation projects that the Columbus Zoo is involved in and, and, and very happy to partner with these organizations. These are organizations are uh, conservation projects that are doing really good work. And um, it's so neat to get to collaborate with um, our, our partners. You bring up a great point because when you, when you tour around a zoo and, and you see the animals maybe as, 
as ambassadors for their for their wild cousins. There's nothing more true that, than, than that with Columbus. You just mentioned just a few, you know, when you're talking about elephants and polar bears and red pandas, how diverse can you be? So when you visit the zoo and you see these animals, they are true ambassadors. And you bring up a very good point about the, 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 mon uh, the monetary side of it. You know, when people look at conservation, they'll often think of it, of it, it as a quite like romantic job and you're out and you're doing all the research. I mean, every piece of research that goes on, every piece of conservation costs money. You know, and, and, and the, 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 the Columbus Zoo and zoos throughout the, the US and in fact throughout the world you know, without those, then, then we couldn't do what we do. Well, I think that's very important, Brian. And I think what a lot of people don't realize that it's just the resources that we take for granted living here in the United States. Um, I mean, I don't have to look very hard for anything, whether it's, it's a hammer and nails and gasoline and anything. It's, it's in our back door. There's a thousand places I could go. Well, when you get out to places like the Cheetah Conservation Fund, when you're out in Namibia, Namibia, and I've been there, I've been very fortunate to be there, those resources aren't in your back door. And so, and a lot of people don't realize that. If you haven't had the opportunity to go to some of these places, you, don't, you, you realize real fast, wow, how do they survive? How do they succeed? And you know, what I tell people, I know so many people when they think of conservation work, they want to go there and think. And truly, the most important thing we can do is money, is raise money, because then those organizations can get what they need to help be successful in whatever conservation you're trying to. Yeah, and you brought up another very good point as well about the messaging and the, the education. Um, I'm putting you on the spot here, but but can you roughly in a normal year, and I'm not classing 2020 as anywhere near a normal year, but what, what's your kind of visitor figures? Yeah. That, How many visitors would we get yeah. in a normal year? Oh, we would, this year we would have probably, we, we were slated for probably about 2.4 million people coming for our dates this year, and we just hit over a million. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this year really, really hit Zoom's hard. So we're talking about, you know, if ever we get back to normality again, 2.4 million taking that into account, which um, I, I'm a lover of analogies. And that's almost exactly the total population of Namibia. So, you know, yeah. you know uh, when you're talking about getting the message out, you know, that, that's the potential. You know, you can, you ju just the Columbus Zoo alone can, can give that messaging to potentially, you know, the population of a whole country. So, you know, and, and they say that the, the education is the, is the foundation of conservation. Well, you know, again, with the messaging, with the education and with the fundraising that you do, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it plays a, a, a huge, huge part. Well, and, and Brian, I could even collaborate a little more on that. I've partnered with the Ohio State University. And one of the other things, you know, we're kind of, we're up against uh, a battle of technology as well, because there are people out there that believe that we can give the same message through a podcast or um, television. And the science that I am working with Ohio State proves that that is not true. And that's why I think zoos are more important than ever. Um, the trend shows that if we take a group of people and we do a live demonstration, and then we take another group of people and give them that exact same educational uh, presentation with, without live animals, the, the knowledge that is retained from the group that has the, lo the live animals is far greater than the knowledge of um, the people that didn't have uh, the live animals. And one of the biggest points, factors I'm getting to, is the people who had the live animals were far more willing to participate in gifts to conservation than the group that didn't have live animals. 
And, you know, part of doing this science is because, you know, zoos are up against uh, some of the animal rights activist groups who, who think that um, these animals shouldn't be in zoos. But I am really a, a firm person. I've been in this business for over 40 years. I know what's going to happen to the animals in the wild if zoos go away and that they're, they're, gonna, they're not going to exist. No, I, I totally agree. And I think an important point to bring up is that you, you, you can't par everything with the same brush. You know, like in every walk of life, there's good and there's bad. There's good zoos and there's bad zoos. You know, Absolutely. and if you do it right, um, which I know I'm biased and you're even more biased, but doing it right, like the Columbus Zoo, um, then, you know, the, the, the contribution that you make within the conservation society or, or the conservation world is second to none. And I, and I honestly cannot see where that could be replaced. You know, if, if we took that out of the equation, I honestly don't see where that replacement would be. I, it wouldn't exist. It would be, it would be irreversible damage. So you, you bring up the, uh, you, the, the, the research on, on that little bit, you know, with, uh, you know, with the live animals and the, and the, the research that, that, that zoos do as well. Um, a lot of that I found is, is, is not exactly behind closed doors. You're not, you're not hiding it, but it kind of bubbles along un underneath the surface that people are not, always aware of you know the 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 daily um research not only through uh, the the husbandry you know looking after the animals in in the best possible way um and the education and, and everything like that but some of the science some of the, the the hard science that goes on in places like the columbus zoo um and what's bubbling around in my mind is is the is the breeding side is the is the genetics and the breeding side tell us a little bit about uh, well obviously i'm so excited about what you're getting ready to talk about or i get to talk about brian um because obviously cheetahs are my passion and um cheetah conservation is what matters to me most and because cheetahs are in so much trouble because of various reasons, loss of habitat, fragmentation, you know, we could go on and on. There's multiple reasons. But um, we know that breeding cheetahs, whether it's in human care or in the wild, is not necessarily the easiest thing. And one of the things that's facing cheetahs right now is they are so fragmented. They're not living, you know, they're kind of sporadic through Africa. And genetically, they're probably getting somewhat watered down. And one of the things we were working on was artificial insemination. And I was working with the Smithsonian Zoo. Obviously, they're the ones doing the science. I'm just the person with the cheetahs. Very well-trained cheetahs, might I tell you, that are trained to volunteer for everything, for all their vaccinations, um, x-rays, ultrasounds, you name it, they volunteer to do it. So we, we're not pushing them. We're not putting them in a squeeze cage. Um, and that, that's one of the reasons it makes research very easy to do here at the Columbus Zoo, because the cheetahs are volunteering for everything. But it didn't make a lot of sense to keep going down the path of artificial insemination with cheetahs, because when it was successful, and it hasn't been successful for 20 years, it only produced one cub. And we know cheetahs are the only cat species that cannot and will not raise a single cub. They won't do it, they can't do it in the wild, and they can't do it in human care. So it didn't make sense to keep going down that rabbit hole. So um, I reached out to Adrian and I said, why aren't we pushing in vitro fertilization? It just seems to be a better science and let's get past the artificial insemination. And she was thrilled. She said, would you be willing to participate? And I said, in absolutely in a New York second. So um, we collected eggs from one of my genetically valuable it's her name is Dee Dee, but she's seven years old. She's never been bred. Chances of her even carrying cubs or breeding is slim to none, but she's valuable. And we um, fertilized the eggs with frozen semen that came from fossil rim from a male in Texas. They were a good match. Um, BB and um, this male cheetah were a good match. 
So Adrian Crozier, the um, coordinator for the SSP, the chair for the SSP, did the science um, with Pierre and he literally made little cheetah babies in a petri dish. And then we had a very good, strong candidate. Her name is Izzy. She was a three-year-old cheetah. She was a product of not of good genetics. It, she wouldn't be an animal we would want to continue to breed. We'd never bred her, but we put those embryos in Izzy, and 83 days later, we had two beautiful cheetah cubs, um, and we named them after the two scientists, Day or Pierre and um, Adrian. But then we did change it. Uh, Pierre's name to David, Dr. David Velt, who was one of the um, true scientists that was very involved with the Smithsonian in in vitro fertilization. So we have those two cheetah cubs here. They're beautiful. They're doing amazing, and they are hopefully the beginning of the science that could really, really help cheetahs in the wild. So you know we need to do it again. As you know, Brian. Uh, proof is in the pudding, and we did it once, and now we need to see if we can repeat. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a great story, and and it's it was a long time coming because, like you said, for for twenty years, you know, the 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 foundation of the science was there, yeah. um, but it just it just wasn't getting anywhere. Uh, well, and, I'm, I'm sorry, Brian, to interrupt you, but what, I think one of the cool partnerships. Um, Pierre, who uh, he's originally from France, he said one of the reasons of the success was because our cheetahs, you know, were all about training, and um, our cheetahs were so well trained. He didn't know of another facility where we could have successfully did this. And not only, I, I even have to go one step further. These animals are so well trained, and everything we do is for positive reinforcement. We were able for the first time, Brian, to take a human breast pump and pump milk from Izzy. And that milk was sent to the Smithsonian and they were able to analyze cheetah milk. We were able to collect enough milk from that cheetah. So for the first time, we were able to uh, positively um, analyze what is uh, the makeup of cheetah milk. So we learned a lot. Yeah. Again, there's so, there's so many layers to it, you know, and 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 it's using, you know, and and not all that you find out is useful, you know. But it, it's it's about just keep on going and building that uh, that uh, that bank of knowledge up, and and it and it's not again even even something like this. It needs the collaborations. It right. needs. The, the the collaboration uh, between zoos, between conservation organisations, but you know universities, you, you name it. You know everybody can play a part, and this stuff costs money. You know it, it, it's you know if um, you know you ask a conservation organisation to do something in the field, be it you know collecting sperm, which which obviously uh, CCF have been doing for many many years and banking it. Every single sample not only costs to collect it, but it also costs to store it as well. So it kind of goes full circle where you know the, the the science is there, the research is there, the knowledge is there as a foundation to move forward, but also you know the, the generous donations that come in from zoos, your visitors, our supporters, our donors, um, you know, that that keeps the, the wheels turning. You know, and that's the way that we're going to save the species. It, it's the only way we're going to save the species. And, you know, Brian, it's, the, the science obviously takes thousands and thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And without what we don't want to get into is a position where we need, you know, the only thing that's going to save that animal is the science and we don't have it. And so it's critical. You know, we are now getting to that wall where you know we do need to fine-tune these things and in order to save these cheetahs and it's and it's um it, people just you know i i run across people every day and it's i i truly say if you want to help send money it's money that helps these conservation groups they know what they're doing they you know they they have 
the knowledge and the and the people and the experience to do what they're doing, but they just need funds. And I and I can I am that person to tell you they're not living high on the hog in Namibia. <laughs> they're not, you know, and at these conservation. I mean, it's it's amazing to see. And I think one of the coolest things, and Brian, I know you're very passionate about this. And and you are, I always sit there and say it's cheetahs, it's just cheetahs. It's not just cheetahs. It's the whole holistic approach. If we don't help the people in the regions to be successful, and we don't help all the other animals, um, the cheetahs aren't going to survive either. So it is definitely, um, it, it, it is a holistic approach. And you do have to work with everybody. And the best way to do that, and if I can encourage anybody, if you have an extra $45, $50, or a million dollars, you need to send it to um, conservation organization like the Cheetah Conservation Fund. That, that's that's great to hear because I say I can't really say that because I am totally biased, but um, I, I I can't disagree with anything you said. And just to 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 round that up, I think one of the important things that that I've found over the years of working in conservation and and in zoos and wildlife parks, you know, if, if you're just um, reactive. The conservation problems, be it the survival of a species, you know, the communities. Ultimately, I believe it will fail. You know, you can't act quick enough if all you're being is is reactive. And the uh, using the example of the uh, of the in vitro type thing, you know, all the work that you're doing, really, what you're doing now is being proactive. You know, you're being time, and I think that's the key to uh to to conservation you know you're doing a lot of stuff that maybe from the outside doesn't look totally relevant now but without without doing it now if we wait for 10 years to do it like you said we could lose not only the cheetah but goodness knows how many species so being proactive you know and and supporting the zoos that support us and supporting us directly whatever way that people do it really what they're doing is they're being proactive you know they're not just waiting for you know these um and and, and sometimes don't get me wrong sometimes it is very reactive and, and and i can use another example where the columbus zoo have, have really um kind of pulled out the stops i mean it's actually a year ago now when i was in somaliland you know and the 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 illegal wildlife trade kind of almost exploded um, and uh, we, we was having to look after so many cubs and building this new thing. And so we had to be reactive. We had to buy time for those young cheetahs. And the Columbus Zoo were one of the key players in enabling us to actually get out there on the ground and save those cubs. So you may have seen the, the, the pictures of, uh, of, the, of the cubs in, in Somaliland and, and some of the stories that go on, the success stories. You know, they're not all success stories, but, you know, there are a lot of successes out there. And that I can I can contribute to, you know, our supporters, our donors and places like the Columbus Zoo, because they really, you know, you really stood up and. And, uh, and, well, and, and just to let you know, Brian, I remember that, you know, vividly. And, and it was once again, I sit there and say we take for credit the resources we have here. And how do you get supplies to Somalia land? You know, we had, I knew, we knew of people that were going and um, there were, you had baby cubs coming in. Uh, there was no formula. There were no antibiotics. There were so many supplies. And literally it was, you guys get me a list as quickly as you can. We had some funds in our cheetah conservation fund. I quickly sent them over to the vet. They ordered the antibiotics. We were able to get formula. We were able to get these, um, chats that we filled with um, medication supplies, everything that we knew would help at least give these babies half a chance. And um, because we had knew, we found out two people were going and they were able to transport these supplies because otherwise there would have been no way they would have ever made it. And um, that's the kind of thing that people don't see us doing, you know, they, they don't realize zoos are running around crazy trying to get this stuff together. I mean, I think I had 24 hours. I was getting hot water bottles. And, you know, it, 
heating pads don't work because how are you going to plug them in? You didn't necessarily have electricity over there. And so, um, you know, we had to think of everything that we could, blankets, things um, that we could get there. And um, I don't think a lot of people have any idea that myself, my assistant, our veterinarians were running around crazy trying to drum up as much supplies as we could, knowing that this was our only chance. This was our one shot to get these um, supplies to these babies and, and to CCF because they needed them. And if it wouldn't have been for the people that support cheetah conservation here at the Columbus Zoo, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Absolutely. And, and again, I was out there, so I saw it firsthand, you know, where um, you, you, you're totally right. You know, it, it's pointless. It wasn't as though the, the stuff is just expensive. It's just not there. It's not available. You know, you right. cannot get it. Um, and because of the, you know, the political situation and everything out there, you know, it, you can't just nip down to the post office and send stuff. You know, it's impossible. There's no, there's no infrastructure there to do it. So, you know, we, so, you know, you can tell your supporters that, that uh, you know, as a direct result of that manic week or whatever it was, you had to get the stuff together. You save cheaters, you know, no, no, that that's not being idealistic or anything like that. Those cheetah cubs were saved because of the actions of people like them. So it's uh, you know there, there's always a positive. Sometimes it's a nightmare situation, um, and we find ourselves in a nightmare year this year. Um, which, uh, you know we, we all we all want to forget, but at the same time we have to carry on. You now we have to we, we're still working out in the field, and and like likewise. You know, you're still having to work um, there to look after your animals and generate the funds not only to support us, but you know, in the short term, more importantly, to to support yourself. So, how has um, uh, COVID? You, you mentioned some of the numbers um, as far as you know, you, you, your your working and, and your um, the operation of the zoo. How much is that hit uh, Columbus? You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, Brian. Um, it's COVID really hurt the zoo industry, and it really hurt us here in Columbus. One of the reasons is because we are such a big organization, we didn't qualify for any government support. And, you know, I'm not going to downplay anybody. I think everybody's business is, um, is essential to them. And I know having to shut down your business and not have income coming in is, is horrible. So I'm not going to say one business is worse than another, so forth and so on. But at least when you close the store, if you owned a clothing store and you, you know, let the employees, you have to let them go and they can collect unemployment. The downside here at the Columbus Zoo, you know, we were shut for over three months, but it still cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars every day to feed and care for over 10,000 animals. And obviously, we are never going to jeopardize the animal welfare or the, the good husbandry. Our standards are very high, and we're not going to compromise on that. But the downside of that is it put us millions and millions of dollars in the hole. And we lost our most, um, our biggest months, Brian, when we would make the most amount of money to carry us for the rest of the year. Those are the months that we lost. And so we have no way of making that up. And, you know, we're doing the best we can at this point. We're still at minimal capacity. And um, so it, 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 it's tough. You know, I've been here 40 years. I have to say it may not be as hard on me because I started at the Columbus Zoo when Columbus Zoo was one of the worst zoos in the country. It was very small. We didn't have a lot. Um, I know what it's like to work in an organization that doesn't have anything, but it is challenging because not only are we trying to stay afloat, we're trying to recoup. We're trying to get, you know, where we left off. It's going to take us at least, at least three years, uh, probably closer to five to be able to get um, where we can support conservation again to the level that we work. And that breaks my heart because that is why 95% of us are here. That is why we do what we do. 
it is to um, help these animals in the wild. And um, it's, it's tough, you know, I haven't been able to be there for CPF and, and other organizations that really mean more to me than anything because of this. So um, I hope other people are um, understanding that and um, will step up because we can't give the funds that we did, at least for a couple of years. And I, I hope there's that person that hears this story and um, can step up and do it. Yeah, yeah again, when you, when some people look at a zoo, and I did mention it before, and I don't apologize for mentioning it again, but when you see, you know, when you judge a zoo as just a business, just a money-making operation, well, I'm sorry, but the, but everything is a business. Life is a business. You know, your income and your expenses has to balance somewhere. You know, and and it's what you do with the excess that that uh, that that's that's most important. You know, and, and um, I see the, the places like the Columbus as part of the conservation family. You know, and sometimes members of the family they have hard times. You know, and it's all about supporting each other. And I can't, I can't speak highly enough um, about the work that you do, both, you know, in front of the in, in front of the curtain and behind the curtain as well. You know, uh, I've seen it firsthand, and um, Columbus Zoo doesn't pay me anything, so I'm not. This isn't a a paid ad or anything like that. You know, um, you really do. Um, step up and you put your money where your mouth is, whether it's you know physical money or whether it's the, the the work behind the scenes being reactive, proactive, and and I think people need to to understand that before they become too judgmental and just tar every um, captive animal with the with us with the same brush. Yes, we would all love to see every animal out, out in the wild, but unfortunately we don't live in a perfect world that's an absolute impossibility and species will go extinct without well, you know brian when we were talking about um the in vitro fertilization and i can give you a good example of science that it was too little too late and it's the vaquita um you know there was an example of all zoos coming together we knew what there were approximately less than 30 vaquitas left in the waters of Mexico in very dangerous waters. And all of a sudden, when we realize this, we are like, we've got to go in, we have to save, all the zoos need to band together and save this animal. But the problem was we had no information. The information was so little and we weren't able to get the information. And um, there's an example of, you know, too little, too late. And um, you know that animal, unfortunately, is probably not going to make. It. It's probably going to become extinct in our lifetime. We kind of had to abandon that conservation efforts because um, we knew we weren't going to be safe. And um, cheetahs, I think, have a chance because we do have organizations like the Cheetah Conservation Fund that are amazing conservation organizations doing amazing work. And I know there's more. There's, you know, I, I'm not just going to say CCF, although it's very near and dear to my heart. There's Action for Cheetahs. There's, there's so many. And um, everybody doing a lot of hard work, getting the science, getting the information. Um, but when you were talking about zoos, you know, and uh, big zoos, I think people still need to remember we are a nonprofit organization. And so we're not a big company making a ton of money. Um, we are trying to make money for conservation projects and for these animals in the wild. We are trying to participate in the science that can improve their life in the wild. Um, animal welfare is a huge turn of ours. I mean, I partner with Ohio State constantly doing all sorts of welfare studies and cortisol studies and um, to make sure um, these animals are, are living a very, very good, what I would consider a good life. And I do have to say, you know, I think my mother said it best. She said, hopefully one day you will come back as one of your animals. <laughs> and so I do know um, that as much as there, and I don't know that there's that many critics out there, but there are some critics of zoos. I do wish they would dig a little deeper and see what we're doing. And, um, you know, maybe. 
a lot of these animals, it's not so bad for them. And um, being able to connect the information. And like I said, and you said it best, these animals are ambassadors to their cousins in the wild. And very, very important for both. And unlike with most things in life, you have to be very careful what you wish for. Yep, you do. You have to be very careful what you wish for. And, and I can have the science that will probably prove that, Brian. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Susie, I just want to thank you ever so much for, for finding the time to talk to us. And I know how busy um, all you and your team are there. I just want to thank you for your, for your ongoing support and your dedication and your passion towards conservation in the wild. So, Susie, thanks very much. And hopefully we'll speak to you again really, really soon. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank everybody to the Conservation Fund I, um, for their amazing work. You know, it's, it's amazing um, what, what they're doing for cheetahs. And I will, as long as I physically can, I will be supporting the Cheetah Conservation Fund. We appreciate it. Thanks, Susie. Thanks, Brian. We're always very appreciative of places like the Columbus Zoo and other zoos around the world that support us in our efforts on the front line to save the cheetah in the wild. So don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to our channel for updates and some notifications of some exciting video projects coming up. Thank you.